Uh, born and raised in Mount Pearl. Uh, went to Mon, went down to Texas and got his doctorate degree. Went off to uh, Australia for 12 years, uh, working in, uh, in the fish biology, and then decided to come home because he wanted to fish every year, and he did while he was in Australia, but he, the flying back and forth got too much for him, so he, he came back to Canada, and uh, now he's you know, salmon fishing a little more often, so he's an avid, avid uh, salmon fisherman as well. And I think Steve, your talk tonight is on Atlantic salmon conservation in a changing environment. So with that, I'll give you uh, Steve Sutton. Thank you, Don. I've been called a lot of things in my time. I think that's the first time I've ever been called a feature. <laughs> I'll take that as a good thing. Uh, and thank you all for uh, having me here tonight. Uh, I know I'm intruding on your fly time, but um, lots of time for that, hopefully, and I might even stay, stick around and try to learn something. So this is a talk that uh, the Atlantic Salmon Federation has put together in honor of the International Year of the Salmon, which was last year, but uh, outreach and education component of that will continue for the next two years. So um, I've, I've tweaked it a little bit for the Newfoundland audience. We've, uh, we've got some unique features about our Newfoundland fishery that we'll get into in a minute. So I want to start with a few graphs showing the status of salmon throughout North, the North Atlantic. Uh, all of the information that I'm going to show in these graphs comes from a report that's put out every year by the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas. They take whatever data are available on salmon returns from, say, for example, our county fences, uh, any other... What are you saying there, Craig? Volume. Oh, volume. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, so counting fence data, uh, fisheries data, catch and effort, anything that we have available, and they put this report together every year looking at the status of wild salmon in the North Atlantic. Let's say right up front there's a lot of holes in that data. We have seven or eight hundred salmon rivers in Canada alone, and most of them we don't actually know, you know formally what's going on in there. So. Take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but this is the best data that we have. So this graph shows the pre-fishery abundance of wild salmon in the North Atlantic that will return to North American waters. So that's essentially the salmon that are out there in the ocean right now getting ready to come back to North American rivers either this summer coming or next summer, or a few of them will actually not come back for three summers. We use the pre-fishery abundance because it doesn't, it means we don't have to worry about the effects of fisheries. So these are the fish that are out there before any fisheries operate on them. We have data going back to 1971. You can see in the early years, good numbers of fish. The highest was about 1.7 million there in the early 70s. And I should point out that we were fishing salmon very hard in these days, in the early days. The commercial fishery off Greenland was operating. We had commercial fisheries operating here in Canada as well. If you go back far enough before those fisheries, that's going to be, that number is going to be a lot higher. But even in those days when we were fishing them hard, they were holding their own couple of million salmon out there belonging to North America. Starting here in the late 80s, in the early 90s, we saw this big decline and then no real recovery after. We closed all our commercial fisheries here in the early, mid, early and mid-90s. We did not see much recovery, a little tiny bit maybe there in the later days, later years. This line, the black line, is the number of spawners. So these are the number of fish that actually made it back to our rivers in each year. A Couple of things. In the early days, you see a big gap between the pre-fishery abundance and the number of spawners. That, of course, is because all these fish in between were taken in our fisheries, mostly our commercial fisheries. Once we closed our commercial fisheries, this line comes much closer together because we're not taking as many fish. We closed our fisheries around here, and again, no recovery really in the number of spawners, although if you look at the line, there seems to be a little bit of an increase. But the thing to, to really notice here is that in the early days, you'd have this number of spawners would produce that number of fish, these days, the same number of spawners or more only produces that many fish. So salmon populations were more productive in this period than they are here. And it wasn't just North America. Here's some data for Europe going back as far as 83. Again, a similar pattern. 
big decrease in that late 80s, early 90s period, and no real recovery. A big difference here between uh, pre-fishery abundance and number of spawners, because in Europe they're still operating a few commercial fisheries. So I want to look a little closer to home, Newfoundland and Labrador. The data for Newfoundland and Labrador uh, are hard to get the pre-fishery abundance. So I've had to go into the report that's produced and sort of manipulate things a little bit, put some things together to try to get this uh, graph. So this is, you know, again, take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. The numbers I wouldn't worry about. It's more the trend that I'm interested in. But if you look at Newfoundland and Labrador, early days, the big numbers of fish, big decline, but then unlike just about everywhere else in North America, we actually see a recovery. These days we have about as many fish as we used to have in the early 70s when salmon populations were considered healthier. And again, if you go back far enough in the past, this number here is going to be much higher because again, we were fishing our fisheries pretty heavily in the early 70s. Newfoundland and Labrador these days, uh, from, these are data from like 2018. We now have, because of the declines everywhere else, of all of the grilts in Canada, small salmon, Newfoundland and Labrador has 92% of them in 2018. 54% of all the big fish, and when you put it together, in 2018, Newfoundland and Labrador had 80% of all the salmon in North America. That is, that, and that is largely because salmon elsewhere have declined quite drastically. Do you know why that is? Uh, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Oh. Yeah. So, Newfoundland and Labrador is a big place. We have 186 scheduled salmon rivers and another couple of dozen that are not scheduled that have salmon. So, let's take a look at uh, the island and Labrador separately. So here's what happened on the island of Newfoundland after we closed our commercial fisheries in 1992. We don't see much recovery, but we don't see much of a decrease either. Populations have, have gone along you know, from about just under 200,000 to just over 300,000, and they kind of go up and down around that number. So no, no real recovery on the island of Newfoundland, but no decrease either. But Newfoundland itself is a big place. And if you start digging into what we've got, we see that this isn't universal either. Now again, a little bit of another grain of salt here. Um, when you start getting down to this sort of level on the regional basis, the data in some of these areas is not very good. We don't have uh, monitoring facilities in all of the areas. But ICES, uh, ICES publishes the, the data, so I'm going to show it. So the, these are the graphs um, for the various zones in Newfoundland. So what we see when we look close at Newfoundland is from zone 13 all the way up the west coast, all the way around to zone 6 at uh, Cape Bonavista, we see signs that things have actually increased over time in the northern part. When you look at the south coast and the Avalon Peninsula, these two graphs, we see that things continue to decline. So that's our best understanding of the status of salmon populations on the island of Newfoundland. So you combine those two and you get sort of no real trend across time. So that means that the increase that we've seen must be in Labrador, and indeed it is. So this blue line is Labrador since we closed our commercial fisheries on the island of Newfoundland, and we do see quite an increase um, over that time, and that accounts for that line there. But again, Labrador is also a very big place. And if you start looking at the specifics around Labrador, you see uh, also variation. So in Labrador, we only have four monitoring facilities. Three of them are in southern Labrador, all of them around this area here. We've got uh, Southwest Brook on the Paradise River, Muddy Bay Brook, and Sand Hill River. On the left, we've got grilts, small salmon, and on the right, we've got large salmon. If you look at the grilts, a uh, little bit of a decline in all rivers with large salmon. Goes up and down, but no real trend there either. In northern Labrador, we have one counting facility. Northern Labrador has more salmon habitat than southern Labrador and more salmon ha habitat than the island. We have one counting facility there. Uh, it is difficult to get the, to. It is isolated, so there are reasons for that. The counting facility in northern Labrador is on the English River, which is not a large river, 
and it is more known for its Arctic char than salmon. But nevertheless, that's where the counting facility is. And when we look at the graph over time, we see a big increase in grills and a big increase in large salmon on that one river. And so that's what's driving that graph showing the increase in Newfoundland and Labrador over time. It's all because of that one counting facility in northern Labrador. So that's where Newfoundland and Labrador stands, or that's our best estimate anyway of where Newfoundland and Labrador stand. So I want to come back to this graph now, back to the big picture of North America. And again, we have this, we have this situation where in the early days, salmon populations appear to be much more productive than they are now. The decline happened right here, late 80s, early 90s. Something happened there. Something happened to reduce the productivity of salmon populations, not just in Newfoundland and Labrador, all across North America and across Europe as well. So the first clue there is that we're seeing those declines right across the range of wild salmon, which tells us there's probably something going on in the ocean. If it was in the rivers, we would expect to not necessarily see that such a broad decline. The next clue is that it wasn't just salmon that collapsed at that time. Everybody would be familiar with what happened to the northern cod fishery. Again, you know, if we were fishing cod very hard at this time, historically there would have been more, but cod were holding their own right up until the late 80s, and then we saw this big decrease and we closed our fisheries and we saw very little recovery until a little bit starting around 2012. What a lot of people may not know is that Capelin actually collapsed at the same time. We don't have a lot of historical data on Capelin, at least I couldn't find any, uh, but we do know that at exactly the same time, Capelin stocks took a big drop, no recovery until a little bit starting around 2012. Everything in the ocean eats Capelin, cod, salmon, just about everything depends on Capelin. So you might think, okay, well, Capelin stocks collapsed and that caused everything else to collapse. Well, we know that this, we don't think this was due to overfishing in Capelin, so we're not really sure why Capelin stocks collapsed. But there's a couple of other clues as well as to what's going on with our wild salmon. Scientists have been collecting data on salmon in the North Atlantic Ocean going back for many years into the 60s. Uh, they've been collecting stomachs from wild salmon. And so it gives us the ability to go back and look at what wild salmon in the ocean out there in the North Atlantic have been eating over time. Well, as you might expect, since about 1990, the amount of capelin in the camp salmon's diet has declined drastically. There's not as many capelin, so of course they're going to decline. Salmon are able to still find food, but now they're feeding on things like juvenile squid and these little amphipods. So salmon can get food, but these things are not nearly as nutritious as capelin. Capelin are a fatty fish, they have a lot of energy. So salmon are no longer able to get their preferred food, and when they do, or when they can get food, they're getting things that are not as nutritious for them as capelin. But looking even further, there's some research been done on the energy density of various prey species out there in the North Atlantic. So by energy density, I mean the amount of energy per gram or per pound of feed, food. So think of it, think of it in terms of you know, the difference between carrots and pizza. Pizza has a lot more energy per pound than carrots. You want to lose weight, you don't eat a pound of pizza, you eat carrots, right? Same, same weight, a lot less energy in the carrots. Look what happened to the energy density of two of the key prey species for salmon right around 1990. Capelin, energy density decreased, and hearing a big decrease in the energy density. So even when salmon are able to get their preferred food, it's not providing them with the same energy as it used to since 1990. And so this tells us that whatever happened out there in the ocean happened at a lower level even than these animals that salmon are eating. And so what we think happened now, what scientists think happened now, is that right around that late 80s, early 90s period, there's what they would call a regime shift in the North Atlantic Ocean. And it has influenced the amount of productivity out there and the distribution of productivity. So, you know, the, the, the very building blocks of, of the uh, ecosystem in the ocean has changed. And so that's filtered up to things like capelin and hearing, and that in turn is filtered up to salmon and cod and other things. And that seems to be one of the key things underlying the decline in salmon 
that started in the, the late 80s period. That answer your question? Starting to? Okay. So, so there's a lot we still don't know about what's going on out there in the ocean, but these are some clues that tell us that whatever happened with salmon around that late 90s period, it wasn't overfishing, it was something else, something around the ecosystem. And so that regime shift has really uh, influenced the productivity of salmon populations after about 1990. And so what, what that's really done then is it has influenced or, or decreased the survival of, of wild salmon in the ocean. So everybody knows our salmon grow up in the fresh waters, they turn into a smolt, at three or four or five years, they go to sea, they grow for a year or two, and then they come back. Historically, some rivers in Newfoundland, Labrador, we might have seen 10, even 15% of our wild smolts would survive and come back to our rivers. These days, the survival in some rivers is down to one or 2%. Newfoundland, where we are more grilts rivers than, uh, more grilts than large salmon, it tends to be a little higher, we might get five or 6%. But still, that's a fairly big decrease. From 15% down to five or 6%, you're losing a lot of adult salmon out there in the ocean. And so that, uh, that decrease in sea survival has, it has, the, has the effect of making salmon populations a lot less resilient to other things that we do to them. And we are very good at doing bad things to salmon. We dam their rivers, we mess up their habitat, we put aquaculture, we cut down the trees, we fish them, we poach them. So, because the ocean is not as productive as it used to be, and it's not sending us back as many salmon as it used to, it means that these things are having a bigger impact, or it's, it's magnifying the impact of these, these sorts of stressors. And the other thing that we notice is that where we have more of these things, or where these things are more uh, strong, salmon populations tend to be doing worse. And what that means, really, is that we see this sort of north-south gradient, south-north gradient in our salmon populations in North America. The southern part of the range down in the United States, the Bay of Fundy, where we do a lot of these things all together, salmon populations are doing a, a lot worse. In the United States last year, I think they had about 1,000 salmon come back, and some of those are hatchery fish. Uh, the Bay of Fundy has all been declared or assessed as being threatened and endangered. When you get into the northern regions, northern Newfoundland and Labrador, where we have less of these stressors, salmon populations tend to be doing a little better because we aren't doing as many of these things to them as we are in other places. So that's the bad news. Uh, worst news is this low marine survival doesn't appear to be going anywhere anytime soon. These are some um, headlines that I've pulled off the CBC website over the past 18 months or so. Remember that uh, those two graphs I showed of, of cod and capelin? A little bit of an increase, a little bit of recovery seemed to start around 2012. Well, that's gone. 70% decline in capelin in the last year and a half. Scientists don't believe it's due to overfishing. It's again due to environmental factors. Cod had been starting to recover. Cod are now down again, so that's an indication that things are filtering up through. Uh, shrimp stocks are lower and the shrimp's another food for salmon. And this one here, probably the most concerning. Building blocks of ocean food web in rapid decline as plankton productivity plunges. DF, CF, senior DFO scientist says the cause of the collapse is unknown. So this is, these are the building blocks, as they say. These are the things that everything depends on. And if, if our primary productivity is, de is declining, we would expect to see that, again, to filter up through the ecosystem. And there doesn't seem to be any end in sight. We don't know. If this is ever gonna change back, we don't know when it might change back, we don't know what might prom uh, prompt it to change back. So that is basically the, the, uh, the context in which we're working as salmon conservationists these days. We have this low marine survival that's been going on for a while and is likely to continue into the future. And we have very little control over that. So the question is then, what can we do for salmon in this environment of change. And I'll point out, there's still a lot we don't know, but the general feeling is this is probably a climate change issue right here. Um, the water is warming. Uh, we're seeing changes in salinity as ice in, in the Arctic melts. There's a, a range of things that are happening that are probably driving this.
And so if it is indeed a climate change issue, then it probably is going to continue for the foreseeable future. So then that's the context. That's where we are. That's, um, that's the thing that we have to deal with. And we will have to deal with it for the foreseeable future. So, so then within that context then, as salmon conservationists, what can we do to ensure survival of wild salmon in the North Atlantic Ocean? There's two broad strategies that we look at. First is trying to get a better handle on what is actually going on out there in the ocean. We, we have some clues as to what's going on, but we do not know where salmon are dying. We don't know exactly what's killing them, and we don't know if there's anything we could do about it. So the first broad strategy really is investigating salmon mortality at sea. What can we learn? It, what's happening out there? And are there any strategies we can uh, use to deal with it? So in response to that, the Atlantic Salmon Federation and, and our partners, DFO, uh, the, the American government, and a, a range of universities have, over the past 10 years or so, we have been ramping up our research in the ocean, trying to understand where our salmon go and what's killing them and why. We're looking at two different stages. We're tracking the smolts, the little ones that come out of the rivers, about that big, with these little acoustic tags that are put in the fish. We can track them for a couple of months during their early part of their migration. But to get at the, the long term, uh, the, the, the broader migration all the way to Greenland, if that's where they go, we're using these things, the satellite tags. These tags are probably almost the size of this microphone, so they can't obviously go on a smolt. We have to put them on the bigger fish, the, the what we would call here slinks, and they have to be big. They have to be a fish that had come back as a 10 or 12 pounder. We put them on in the spring as they're going back to sea. Here, this, this uh, shows the track of one of the kelts that we tagged in the Miramichi River a couple of years ago. This is the first one I believe we've ever been able to track as far as Greenland using this satellite tag. The different colors represent different months. May, June, July, August, September. Tracked it all the way to the coast of Greenland. The tag, the battery was running out so the tag automatically pops off and transmits the data to the researchers. What we haven't been able to do yet is track salmon back, so we don't know the migratory route yet back. What we're doing is we're now in Greenland, or we're in Greenland in the summer, trying to catch the fish off the coast of Greenland and put these tags on them, try to close that loop at least and get them you know, back here so we can start seeing where the mortality is occurring and hopefully some idea you know, what it is that's causing it. Of course, this is a long-term uh, strategy, right? This, we're not going to get answers to this anytime soon. This is difficult work. It's expensive work. It might be 10 or 15 years before we have answers as to where our salmon are going and why they're dying and when. Salmon don't have 10 or 15 years. We need to be looking at what can we do now in addition to this. So there's probably a lot more to talk about around our tracking research, but I'm going to move on from there because I want to talk about the sorts of things that we can be doing now. Uh, as salmon conservationists to ensure a future for our wild salmon. So the other broad strategy then is to identify the key, imp key human impacts on wild salmon and do our best to reduce those, to give salmon the best chance to cope with this low marine survival. As I mentioned earlier, when you have these human impacts and you've got this low marine survival on top of that, we tend to see those human the, the effects of those human activities are amplified. So within that uh, broad strategy, there's three key areas that we tend to look at uh, around reducing human impacts. The first one I'm going to talk about is freshwater. Probably the best thing we can do for our wild salmon is to make sure our rivers are as healthy as possible and producing as many wild smolt as possible. The more smolt we send out to the ocean, the more we're going to get back. And that will help, hopefully, make our salmon population more resilient to this low marine survival. And certainly give them the best chance for recovery if either ocean conditions change or if we ever find out that there's something we can do about the ocean conditions. So within that strategy, there's a lot of things we can and should be doing around protecting and, and enhancing our rivers. Now, there's a lot of things we do to salmon in the fresh water. We, we dam rivers, we pollute rivers, you know, we've got in, uh, invasive species in some parts of the range. Thankfully, nothing here on the island. Uh, 
you know, forestry practices, bad culverts, all of that sort of thing has an impact on our rivers and salmon in fresh water. On top of that, of course, we've got climate change also occurring in our fresh waters. We are seeing waters warm. We are seeing changes in flow patterns that are not likely to be positive for wild salmon, except maybe in northern Labrador. If there's any place where climate change is going to have a positive impact on salmon, it's at the northern part of their range. That may help explain what's going on there in Labrador. Certainly in the southern part of the range where the waters were already warm, we are seeing major impacts there as well. So there's a lot we do to salmon in fresh water. The good news is there's a lot we can do to help uh, protect and restore our rivers. So the first thing we want to look at is protecting what we've got. Here in Newfoundland, Labrador, we are actually pretty lucky. Yes, there are impacts on our rivers. We have put dams up. We have done things that we shouldn't do. We cut down the forest. But compared to other areas, we're actually doing pretty well. Our freshwater habitat in Newfoundland and Labrador is not bad compared to most other places in North America and Europe as well. So we need to be protecting that. We need to be making sure that we aren't doing things in our rivers that are going to further contribute to the declines of wild salmon. Part of that is ensuring that we have the appropriate legislation in place to protect our rivers. You probably aware that under the Harper administration, the federal government removed some key protections for fish habitat from the Fisheries Act. Uh, those protections have now been restored under the recent government. The angling community right across Canada was instrumental in putting that pressure on the government to restore those protections in the Fisheries Act. And so it was good to see the angling community and the conservation community in general come together and put that kind of pressure on the government to do the right thing there. So having the legislation in place is important, but making sure the legislation is used the way it's intended is also important. It's one thing to have it on paper, it's a whole other thing to have it actually functioning. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we actually have a pretty good environmental assessment process. You probably don't know that under that assessment process, any uh, undertaking or project that will occur within 200 meters of a scheduled salmon river is required to be registered for environmental assessment. That's something that no other province has. So that means that anything that's likely to cause damage to salmon habitat will at least be registered for environmental assessment. Now, any of you who have followed the uh, Greek aquaculture process over the past few years, you, know, you may know that just because you have it registered doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be done right. So we need to be vigilant. We need to be making sure that when these projects come up, that the assessment process is done properly. And uh, the, the environmental assessment process in Newfoundland, it is a public process. There are opportunities for public to engage. And when that happens, it makes the government be a little more vigilant. So we need, to be, we need to be engaging in those processes whenever we can, whenever anything comes up that might affect our wild salmon. Having legislation and using it is one thing, um, but we need to be looking at other things too. We need to be looking at how do we protect key salmon habitat from a range of activities. One of the things we've been thinking about at the Atlantic Salmon Federation is how do, we, how do we set aside areas specifically for salmon conservation? This one here is a good example. This is the main river at the base of the Northern Peninsula. I see my friend Russ nodding down there. Russ and I fish together every year on the main river. Um, the main river is both a Canadian Heritage River and a Canadian, uh, sorry, uh, um, Canadian Heritage River and a Newfoundland Waterway Park. A big chunk of that watershed is protected from a whole range of activities. And again, uh, the, the impetus for this protection came about when the uh, Corner Brook Pulp and Paper wanted to go in and log a big chunk of the watershed. Anglers mostly stood up and said, hey, that's not right. That's the last old growth forest. This is a healthy river. We shouldn't be doing that. And we managed to get this protection in there. We need to be looking at more of those sorts of things. We need to be looking at identifying key, key rivers, key watersheds, or even parts of watersheds that would benefit from this sort of protection. Those things are not necessarily easy to get, but when you get them, they offer a lot of benefits. And so we might be talking about rivers. Labrador was in pretty good position compared to other um, 
provinces of Canada, and that is true. But that is not to say that we don't have issues here. We certainly do. Um, this is a, uh, so a, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a project um, put together to go and identify all of the water control structures, basically dams across the province, and um, determine whether or not they were impacting salmon. I still think you know, we're, we're still working through some of those things, but initially the uh, project identified over 600 dams and, and uh, well, dams, I guess, um, across the island. This is a map of them. Uh, some of those are no longer in existence. Some of those have been fixed, but many of them still remain problematic for wild salmon. One of the areas we have been making progress on around water control structures is some of these old wooden um, they would be um, for logging, logging dams to hold back water for driving logs down rivers. Those are easy. They're not in use anymore. They've been abandoned. A lot of them are rotten, but you can see that they can really um, affect the access of salmon to habitat. So there's been a lot of work actually done around the province to identify some of these dams and take them out. So that sort of work really does help us restore our uh, salmon access to uh, fresh water. Culverts were not included in that uh, map. Culverts can be a problem, you know. Juvenile salmon can't get past that. Some culverts, you know, result in, uh, in improper runoff. This is one in, ironically, in Main River, on the very uh, top of Main River, outside of the Waterway Park, I believe. That was a, a causeway and a little tiny culvert put in there for the uh, transmission line construction. We need to be looking at these things because these can really affect salmon habitat. Um, you know, replacing things like this with salmon-friendly culverts takes money, but it's certainly doable. So those are the sorts of things we can be doing around those. When we have fixed some of these problems, then we can look at restoring salmon. So this is an example of a, a great restoration project that's going on right now on the Rattling Brook watershed that flows into the Bay of Exploits just to the east of the Exploits River. That river was dammed back in the early part of the 1900s. I'm not sure what the date was, but uh, the water was diverted. The, there used to be a nice little salmon run in there, some big fish in there. That was completely eliminated because of the dams on that river. Back a few years ago, when I believe there was a relicensing of some of those dams, the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans required that in order to continue for the company, Newfoundland Light and Power, to continue operating those dams, that they would have to put in fish passage and restore salmon to the watershed. So there's now a project going on, uh, led by the town of Norris Arm, DFO, and Newfoundland Light and Power to do exactly that. And they have been doing that over the past three years. Last year, they had just over 400 salmon returned to the watershed. The year before that, they had 550. So this shows that when you fix the problems, you can actually restore salmon to some key watersheds. There's, there's not as many opportunities for this in Newfoundland as there are in other places, certainly in places like Maine and the Bay of Fundy. It's all about restoration these days. But there are still some opportunities for us to be looking at restoration in our fresh waters. So I want to move on. Uh, so that's freshwater habitat. I want to talk a little bit about fisheries and fisheries management. I said earlier that all of our commercial fisheries in Canada have now been closed, and this is true, but we still have significant recreational fisheries. We have First Nations fisheries in Canada. Sometimes when I do this talk in other places, particularly areas where salmon populations are not as healthy as Newfoundland, people ask, well, why should we even have any fisheries? If salmon populations are that bad, Shouldn't we just close our fisheries and let salmon populations recover? I don't see anybody nodding yes here, so that's good. Um, I mean, that's one perspective, right? But I don't actually believe that, and I think a lot of people who are anglers probably don't believe that either. Two reasons. One, the reason why salmon populations are at a low level these days is not a fisheries issue. You close the fishery, you're not likely to get any recovery because on the most part, at least generally, it's not a fisheries issue. And secondly, and probably more importantly, is salmon need people. Salmon need people who care. Salmon need people who are going to be willing to get out there and do this on the, on the groundwork. They need people who are going to stand up to governments and say, hey, you can't put that dam on that river. That's a salmon river. How do people come to care about salmon? 
How many people in this room are recreational fishers? How many people in this room care about salmon? What happens when we have nobody who cares about salmon anymore? We will lose our salmon. I have no doubt about that. We need those fisheries to keep people engaged in salmon and salmon conservation. Fisheries provide a lot of benefits to communities, to individuals. They provide economic benefits. Um, governments love economic benefits. So without people fishing and providing those economic benefits, governments don't have much of an interest either. And I can guarantee you, if we lose our recreational fishery in Newfoundland, it won't be long before governments stop investing in salmon conservation. So fisheries, to me, provide that driving force for conservation. So the question is not, should we have fisheries? But the real question is, how do we make sure that having those fisheries provides a net benefit to salmon populations? There's a few ways we can do that. First and most obvious is we have to be sustainable in our fisheries. It, the argument falls apart if we are overfishing. We can't be overfishing and then claim that we are providing benefits to salmon conservation. So we have to focus on being sustainable. And we do our best. It's not easy. The other thing is we have to be ma making sure we maximize the benefits that we get from these resources. We have to tip that scale in favor of conservation rather than um, uh, the costs around the fisheries. Here in Newfoundland, I'm sure you've all heard or engaged in this, what I would call a rather silly debate over live release or catch and release versus retention. We spend a lot of time as anglers pointing our fingers at each other and saying, I don't like what you do, so you shouldn't be allowed to do it. I think that is a complete and total waste of time. If we can be sustainable, if we can have harvest, we can have retention and it's sustainable, we should have it. Because when you take away people's opportunity to fish, people leave the fishery. And that, in my opinion, is leading to disaster. So maximizing the number of people engaged in the fishery, maximizing the benefits that we get out of the fishery is very important. And we need to be thinking about those things when we're having these discussions about harvest versus catch and release. And finally, we have people who care, but we need to make sure those people are giving something back. We need to be finding ways to engage people directly in conservation, whether that is lobbying government over aquaculture or forestry or whatever, or actually out there on the ground doing this restoration work that I talked about earlier. That's not necessarily an easy thing to do. People, you know, getting people motivated to engage in conservation is not easy. Finding ways for people to engage in conservation is not easy. But it's an important part of the equation. And finally, the, the third key pillar in our approach to salmon conservation involves aquaculture. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about aquaculture in the past few years here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Aquaculture is, well, we know aquaculture has impacts on our wild salmon. There's three key ways they do it. Uh, aquaculture fish escape from the pens, they go up our rivers, they interbreed with our wild fish, and basically they mess up the genetics. And we have good evidence of that having happened on the south coast of Newfoundland. DFO's own data shows that. The other key ways, they're kind of similar. They're around sea lice and diseases. So sea lice are in natural, in the marine environment. They are on wild fish. Anybody's caught a fresh fish in from the ocean have probably seen sea lice on it. The problem is in these cages, the fish are crammed in there together. The sea lice get out of control and they, uh, they're amplified and sent back out to our wild fish. The problem is particularly um, an issue in the spring when the smolts are migrating to sea. They migrate past these cages. They pick up the sea lice. Takes, I believe, the science has shown eight sea lice on a smolt will kill it. So it's not, we're not talking about necessarily about a lot of sea lice. And the issue is similar with disease. These, cage, these salmon in the cages, they pick up diseases from the environment. They, they um, you get a disease outbreaks and those, uh, those diseases are then transmitted back to wild fish. We know a little bit less about the disease issue, but it's certainly growing in um, its importance and its concern.
to me, aquaculture is one of the things that we really should be able to control. This is completely a human impact on wild salmon that really should be, there are solutions. Better regulation is really necessary. Um, the aquaculture industry says they are heavily regulated, and they are heavily regulated. The problem is those regulations are not aimed at protecting our wild fish. So we, we certainly need better regulation across jurisdictions, and we need those regulations to be consistent across jurisdictions and aimed at protecting wild fish. The problem is simply a lack of political will, in my opinion. This is a powerful industry. It provides jobs in rural areas. Governments are very reluctant to interfere and, and put in regulations that are, the industry at least says, will damage their business. But there's other things we can be looking at too around aquaculture. One, I talked a little bit about protecting our freshwaters and, and finding ways to set aside areas in freshwater. Well, what about aquaculture free zones? That's something else we're looking at. Identifying key areas of the ocean that are important for our, our wild salmon, particularly our smolts and the smolt migration routes. Trying to get some protection there by eliminating aquaculture in those key areas. The other thing that people are quite excited about is this idea of closed containment. So either land-based aquaculture or closed containment in the ocean. We're a few years away, I think, from that, but it is growing rapidly, particularly the land-based aquaculture. Um, there's a lot of investment going into land-based aquaculture these days, in the United States in particular. So everybody is quite excited about that, but I think we need to be, we need to be prepared to accept that the open net pens are likely to be in our waters for a while. The industry that's growing up around closed containment is actually, it's basically a separate industry. Different companies, different investment. It, I don't think we will see a change, a shift from ocean to land-based. I think more likely we will see the growth of closed containment that eventually outcompetes land, uh, outcompetes the open net pen guys. But again, that's a ways away. So we still need to be focused on ensuring we have proper regulation of the industry that's out there today. And the more we can put, get those regulations on there and put that pressure on the industry to move towards, um, to move, move towards technology that protects wild salmon, the, the more likely it is that they may eventually take up the closed containment. So that's pretty much it. I've talked for 21 minutes, uh, sorry, 41 minutes. So um, just want to finish by saying these few things that I've just talked about are actually part of the Atlantic Salmon Federation strategic plan that we developed a couple of years ago, and that will go for the next few years. So the four key planks in our strategic plan, and this is, I think this, this thinking reflects the thinking more generally in the conservation community. It's about A, understanding what's going on at sea as the long-term solution, and then the shorter-term solutions are addressing the key impacts on wild salmon. So making sure our fisheries are sustainable and that people involved in those fisheries are giving something back to wild salmon, addressing the effects of open net pen aquaculture, and making sure our rivers are as healthy as possible and producing as many wild smolt as possible. And with that, I will let you guys get on to your fly time, but I'm happy to take questions if there are any.